Hey everyone, and welcome back to another weekly art video. I hope you're having an amazing day, and thanks so much for joining me on this one. Today's fall-inspired watercolor leaf tutorial is beginner-friendly, and we're going to be practicing essential skills and must-know techniques, such as creating pencil sketches, planning colors, and creating color mixtures. We're going to be using both wet on wet and wet on dry. And we're even going to be exploring blooms and splattering. I've broken up my process into four simple steps and we're going to be repeating these four steps with all of these leaves. This way we can practice the same steps over and over so that we can really master this process and the method can truly stick so that you can take it with you to other leaf paintings that you may wish to work on in the future. Of course the shape is different for these leaves so some of them are going to be more challenging to sketch than others and we're also going to be using different color combinations when painting each and I do want to encourage you to explore different color combinations for these different leaves this way you can get the most out of this practice all right so without much further ado let's go ahead and jump straight into phase one of this process and this is of course going to be the preliminary pencil sketch phase usually when I am working on my preliminary pencil sketches I use either an HB or a B grade drawing pencil. As I was creating these sketches and also as I move on to painting them, I am observing reference photos. I was just using them as a loose point to jump off from to get an idea for the shape of the leaf, ideas for leaf colors, etc. I wasn't really trying to copy those references. I knew that as long as I was bringing in the main characteristics for that type of leaf, so its overall shape, the length and direction of its veins, etc. These leaves would look believable. And I make sure to sketch nice and light because of a variety of different reasons. Number one, I don't want to scratch or damage my paper because I'm not going to be able to fix that. Number two, I want to be able to easily erase mistakes and refine my drawing if I need to. And number three, I don't like seeing my pencil work through my paint at the end. You see, watercolor is a transparent medium. So if you press down on your paper too hard as you're drawing and your drawing is very dark, you're very likely going to see your pencil work through your paint at the end. And by no means is this wrong. If it's a stylistic choice, lots of artists out there do enjoy creating darker pencil work and then adding watercolor on top and having their pencil work also show through but for me personally I like my paint and my color to be the star of the show and I don't like to have any graphite muddying up or dirtying up my vibrant color so for me it's very important to keep things nice and light Okay, so I'm starting out with my sketches of what I consider to be the simplest leaves. I'm first creating that general largest shape for the leaf and then I'm adding in that central vein. And oftentimes what I like doing in the beginning is just laying down straight lines that allow me to visualize that shape that I want for my leaf. And then I go over those straight lines to smooth them out and turn them more into a curve. So what this means is I'm not going in and trying to create a perfect curve right off the bat, but I first help myself by laying down a few lines at different angles that help me visualize that curve that I want at the end, and then I bring them together. So this leaf that I am sketching right now has these edges that I think are referred to as serrated edges. So they have these teeth, and this of course adds complexity to the sketch. However, as you just saw right now, I first created that general leaf shape and then I went ahead and added in the serrated edges. Only after that larger general leaf shape was achieved. After I had a nice general leaf shape, I went in to lighten my sketch with my kneaded eraser, gently tapped my kneaded eraser over my sketch, and moved on to adding in those teeth along the edges of the leaf. Once I liked the teeth, I went ahead and used my regular graphite eraser and erased out the initial smooth curves that I had created. When you're drawing in serrated edges like this, you want to make sure that you're looking at reference photos and noticing the direction that those teeth are going towards. 
All right, so moving on to my next leaf here, and this one is way more difficult, at least in my opinion. It's more like a maple tree leaf. So it's not only wider, but it has these different sections to it. And what I found helpful with this one was laying down that middle vein first. And the reason why this is helpful for this one is because this way I know what the halfway point is and it'll help me create that symmetry that I am looking to create between the left and right halves of the leaf. When you have a complex shape like this one and you're looking for at least some amount of symmetry, it's very helpful to locate where that middle line would be so that you can more easily create that mirrored or flipped effect. And and as you can see, I'm working on both sides simultaneously. I progress a little bit on the left side, then I do that same bit on the right. Then I advance a little bit more on the left side, then I advance a little bit more on the right, and so on and so forth, jumping between the left and right halves. Jumping between the left and right halves like this while looking at that reference photo helps me achieve a greater symmetry. For this one, it's also very important to observe what this kind of leaf looks like in real life and notice how its length compares to its width. Remember that your preliminary sketches are the base and the foundation for everything that is coming up next. And we have to make sure that we're spending enough time on our preliminary sketches to make sure that shapes and proportions and all that look right before moving forward. Because if our sketches don't look right, no amount of color work or texture or detail or value development that we do with our paint is going to make these leaves look believable. And yes, there are definitely certain things that we have to make sure to do while we're painting to make sure that at the end these leaf studies will look believable, which I'll be sharing with you later. But first and foremost, it's important to spend as much time as we need to with our preliminary sketching process. A lot of beginners rush through this preliminary sketching process because because they're super excited to start with the painting, but always remember that this is the foundation for what's coming up next. For this one, I even started adding in all of the veins that I haven't added in yet for my other leaves. And this is because since this leaf is more of a complex shape and it has more veins to it, I felt that adding in those veins would give me a better sense of whether my shape was okay the way that it was or if I needed to make any changes. All right, so the next leaf is also relatively complex in terms of its shape, but I do think it's easier than the previous one because the leaves are separate. But I still got started with the largest central vein and started by adding in the largest shape at the top. Once that largest shape for that top leaf was added in, I started adding in the smaller shapes on either side. Once again, you can see me go in and lay down straight lines that help me visualize those curves and those shapes of these leaves. Notice how I'm not going in and trying to create a perfect curve. I'm just creating straight lines that I'm bringing together to visualize that leaf shape. As I'm drawing, I'm comparing the proportions of the leaves in my sketch to the leaves in the reference photo. And I noticed that a couple of these leaves should be slightly larger. So in a bit, you're going to see how I go in and erase a couple of leaves and make them larger. And because I am continuing to draw as lightly as possible, I can very easily fix those mistakes. If you're finding it challenging to draw lightly, I would highly recommend taking time to do drawing drills while holding your pencil effectively for drawing, using the extended tripod grip, the overhand grip, the underhand grip, etc. Just practice drawing different kinds of lines and shapes in a larger sketchbook or newsprint paper pad so that you can really practice moving your entire arm as opposed to just your wrist. Because a lot of the times we're holding our pencil very tightly in a very controlled way and only using the tripod grip, which is what we're trained to do since a very young age when we learn to write. But this is not really the way that we should be holding our pencil when we're drawing especially not in the beginning stages of the drawing process. All right, so moving on to my very last pencil sketch here for my last leaf. And this leaf is way more irregular. It is not symmetrical. It has a lot of different curves to it. I once again start by creating that curve for that central vein, and I actually rotate my paper so that I can draw 
more comfortably. Remember, as I am sketching these in, I'm constantly observing my reference photo for clues and ideas, just to make sure that my shapes and overall proportions for my different leaves look believable. So with this one, as I said, I'm not going for symmetry. I want certain curves to come out more than others, and I'm not really trying to create a pattern here. I'm trying to make the left and right halves look different. Once I'm done with that last leaf shape, I start adding in the veins into the leaves that I haven't added the veins into, and I make sure that I'm looking at those reference photos as I am doing this, and also that they have the lengths that they need. So I'm noticing the angles and any patterns for those veins present in those reference photos for these different kinds of leaves. And it's not necessary to add in all of the veins in those photos, especially the tiny ones. I mostly make sure to add in the central vein and the medium sized veins. I like seeing veins and leaves like the central most important vein, then I have secondary veins coming out of that, and then sometimes I have smaller teeny tiny tertiary veins coming out of the secondary veins. But as I said, it's not necessary to add all of those in. And I also try to make sure that I don't draw those veins in in a super stiff straight way because that can definitely take away from the organic natural look of these objects. All right, so once I finished, the last thing that I did there was I tapped my kneaded eraser over my sketches to lighten them up a little bit more and clean up and remove any excess graphite that might be floating around on my watercolor sheet that might muddy up or dirty up my vibrant color. All right, time to move on to phase number two of this process where we're gonna be choosing the colors that we're gonna be using for these leaf studies and also preparing our first color mixtures. For these leaf studies, I'm going to be using my watercolor set from Daniel Smith, and I am going to be keeping the number of colors that I am bringing in limited, and I am repeating my colors in different leaves. There is no need to use exactly the same colors that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be swatching out all these colors for you on this scrap piece of watercolor paper so that you can see what they look like on paper. And this way you can simply choose whichever colors you have on hand that are most similar and your leaf studies are gonna be awesome. Okay, so because these are fall leaves, I am making sure to bring in a couple of different yellows. So I wanted a cooler yellow and a warmer yellow yellow, I wanted to bring in a red, and I also definitely do want to bring in a green, and I'm also going to be bringing in a brown. So for my cool yellow, that is Hansa Yellow Light. My warm yellow is New Gamboge. My bright red there is Pyro Red. The green that I am going to be using is Undersea Green, and I'm also going to be creating a puddle of burnt umber. So really, I'm just using five different colors and I'm going to be combining them in different ways in all of these leaves. I am using my size 10 round brush to create these nice juicy puddles on my mixing palette, bringing a little bit of water at a time from my container into my paint wells, swiveling my paintbrush in my paint and bringing out a little bit of paint at a time into these mixing areas on my palette. I'm making sure to completely rinse out my paintbrush bristles in between my colors in order not to contaminate the next color and in terms of consistency I'm going for somewhere between a coffee to milk like consistency so approximately 50% paint 50% water is what I'm looking for in my color mixtures okay so right here I'm gonna be swatching out my different colors for you the first one is Hansa yellow light that's that cooler yellow then I have my new gamboge which is this almost orange looking warmer yellow then I have my pyrrole red. Then I have my undersea green. And finally, I'm gonna be swatching out my burnt umber. Now, throughout this painting process for these leaves, I'm gonna be creating variations of these different colors by mixing a couple of these colors together. So what I mean by this is sometimes I'm gonna be using my Hansa Yellow Light in combination with my new Gamboge. Other times I'm going to be creating a reddish orange by mixing together my new gamboge and my pyrrole red. I've already started creating a lighter green on my mixing palette by mixing together my undersea green and a bit of Hansa yellow light. And I'm even going to be creating a more muted down red by mixing together burnt umber and pyrrole red. So right here on the second scrap piece of watercolor paper, I am testing out different color mixtures 
that I might want to bring in during the painting process using these same five colors that I've already chosen. I'm not bringing in any other color, but I do want to get a sense for the different colors that I'm going to be mixing together. I am going to allow myself to mix colors freely throughout the painting process, but I want to make sure that I'm doing a couple of different things in order to stay away from muddiness or undesired colors. The first thing is I'm going to try my best not to mix together more than two colors and that I'm keeping my color mixtures on my palette at least somewhat organized. As you can see, I made sure to keep my warmer colors separate from my cooler colors. And another thing that I wanna continue paying attention to is my complementary colors that I have on my palette. So I have a pair of complementary colors, which are red and green. Red and green are opposite colors in the color wheel and complementary colors mute each other down and you can even start creating brown by accident. So if green and red mix together, you're going to create a darker muted hue. And of course, we're also bringing in a brown and brown is neutral. So if brown starts seeping into your different color mixtures, it's going to mute down whatever color it seeps into. And this can happen on your palette in your color mixtures, but it can also happen as colors intermix while you're painting on your paper. So it's important to pay attention to these things and anticipate and know what can happen when different colors intermix, especially when you're looking for bright, vibrant color. If you want to mute down or desaturate a color, then awesome, go for it, but do it mindfully, do it intentionally. Okay, so before moving into phase number three of this process, I'm going to go ahead and change my water because as you can see, it's pretty murky after having created these first color mixtures. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the painting process. I'm continuing to use my size 10 round brush for all of the painting that I'm going to be doing in this phase for all of these leaves. I'm going to get started with the simplest leaf over here on the top left. I am preparing a light watered down green by mixing together undersea green and Hansa yellow light and adding quite a bit of water into this color mixture to make sure that I'm going in nice and watery, nice and pale initially. And I want you to notice how I'm really going to take my time with this first layer. I'm going to run my paintbrush bristles gently over this entire shape several times sometimes with just water in my paintbrush to soften that color and make sure that I can keep that shape wetter for longer for all of the work that I'm going to be doing next. If you just paint in that initial layer very quickly and don't run your paintbrush bristles over it at least a couple of times, it's very likely that that paint is going to start drying immediately and you're not going to be able to create these nice wet on wet effects where the colors that you're going to be dropping in next merge into that previous color and create nice soft transitions and gradients and blooms. These are wet on wet effects that we're trying to create here for this initial wash in all of these leaves. And if that initial layer of paint starts drying on you too fast, you're not going to be able to create these wet on wet effects. What wet on wet means is you're simply dropping in or painting in color while that initial layer of paint is still wet. So right here, you can see how I am starting to drop in different colors on top of that lighter, paler, translucent green layer. I first dropped in some new gamboge, and I am now dropping in some orange that I created by mixing together my pyrrole red and my new gamboge. And now I'm starting to drop in my darker color that I chose for this leaf, which is my undersea green. So with all of these leaves, you're going to notice that I make my way incrementally towards darker, more saturated use of color. I drop in a little bit of undersea green, and then I finally go in and drop in some of my burnt umber, just a couple of little spots here and there, making sure that I'm keeping everything very irregular. I'm not trying to create any outlines or patterns or anything like that. And once I've arrived at a nice variety of both hue and value all throughout my leaf, 
the last step that I did there for this initial wash before everything started to dry was I removed all of that color from my paintbrush bristles and with a little bit of water in my paintbrush, I did some flicking motions using my index finger. I did a little bit of splattering on that paint that was still wet to create a little bit of texture throughout the leaf. If you do your splattering and you notice that you initially see that texture but then it kind of disappears, it probably means that your paint is a little bit too wet still and all you have to do is wait for a few seconds longer so that it at least starts to dry a little bit more and once your paint has started to settle into your paper a little bit more do your splattering again you're going to notice that the splattering texture actually stays and it's actually remaining visible so in order for the splattering technique to work for that texture your paint has to still be wet but not so wet that it's still moving around a ton and still settling on your paper. Once I was done with that first wash in that initial leaf, it was time to allow that to dry completely and switch on to working on the next leaf. And the process is exactly the same. I'm just going for slightly different colors. So for this one, I am starting with an even lighter green that has more of that Hansa yellow light in it. But as you can see, I'm still going in initially with my green in a very watered down translucent state so that I can make sure that that initial layer is very light and very translucent and that I'm building on that lighter layer of color. If there's any doubt that maybe your paint is too saturated or doesn't have enough water in it for that initial layer, I would recommend testing out your color mixture on your scrap piece of watercolor paper to make sure that it looks very light and very transparent. And if it doesn't look very light and very transparent, add a little bit more water into your color mixture. Make sure that you're only painting in a small amount of color. And if you find that you go in too quickly with way too much color, stop what you're doing, remove all of the color from your paintbrush bristles and go back in with just water in your paintbrush to pull and distribute that color that you've already placed on your paper and distribute that color into that larger shape using just water in your paintbrush. That's gonna make that color look paler and lighter but pay attention to how much color you're placing on your paper. And if you notice that you're placing way too much, remove that color from your paintbrush quickly and go in while that paint is still wet to soften it before it dries. If you go in way too dark or way too saturated with that initial layer, you're not gonna be able to develop that wide range of values and transparencies that you're wanting to develop in order to make these leaves look believable. By starting nice and light and pale, you're giving yourself room to develop a wide range of values and translucencies so that at the end of the painting process, you have some sections that look light and pale and other sections that look darker and more saturated. And of course, because we're also painting fall leaves today, we're also trying to create a variety of hue or color so that these leaves look like they are turning. All right, so as you can see, I am continuing to work around this leaf. I am working section by section, starting with my lightest color and spending enough time with that initial layer and then starting to drop in my different colors on top of that. And these are blooms that I am creating right here. All of those spots where I dropped in that orange on that green or that red on that green or even that darker green on top of that lighter green and I create these nice soft transitions between my different colors, that is referred to as a bloom when painting with watercolor. And I want to encourage you to play with these kinds of effects, explore dropping in different colors and creating textures and irregularity. Drop in that paint, allow it to do its own thing and leave it be. Don't go in and try to get rid of these effects, embrace them. Right here, you're gonna see me do a little bit of lifting. So I feel like I go in with too much of this darkest green all along the edge and it was looking a little bit too outliney for me. So the moment that I see that, I remove that color from my paintbrush bristles and I go back in and do a little bit of lifting or absorbing with the clean and slightly damp bristles of my paintbrush and I just use the bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge to remove that excess color and reveal a little bit more of that paper under that paint to add dimension back into that area. 
Lifting, in my opinion, is a must-know technique when it comes to painting with watercolor as it helps you easily correct mistakes. With this leaf, I try to use more of my orange color mixer and also my red. And once I have developed a nice range of color and value and my paint is still wet, I do my splattering technique with a little bit of water in my paintbrush. You can see how I'm dropping in those colors in a very irregular way so that everything can look very organic. And something that is very important as well throughout this process is I am not going in and starting to mindlessly merge my colors together after I've placed them on paper. I try to place my colors confidently, drop them in and allow that paint to do its own thing. If I have to go in and help that paint move around a little bit more, I go in and do it minimally and only if it's truly necessary. But the more you go in and start moving that paint around and start trying to merge colors together, the greater the chance there is that you're gonna start creating muddy colors, especially if you're combining red or orange with green in your leaf, which as I said before, red and green are complementary colors. So whether they start mixing on your mixing palette or on your paper, especially if you're going in and you're starting to blend them together, manually you're likely going to start creating mud and you could even arrive at an overworked look in your leaf from doing so much blending okay so I finished up with that second leaf and I am now working on the maple leaf so with this one I am using different colors I am going in initially with a watered-down new gamboge my warmer yellow and you can see me really taking my time with this one this is definitely a larger shape and a more complex shape so take your time with this beginning layer really go over everything very carefully three to four times or more it depends on the environment that you're working in if you are working in a warm environment, a cold environment, a dry or humid environment, or you have a fan on or a heating system on or an air conditioning unit on, all of those things are going to have a huge impact along with the type of paper that you're using. All of this is going to have an impact on how quickly or how slowly your paper starts to dry. But the trick here is to take your time with that initial layer. Run your paintbrush bristles over everything several times very gently. And once you have arrived at a nice even sheen all throughout that initial pale lightest layer, you can go ahead and start dropping in your second and third colors making your way gradually incrementally towards your darker and more saturated color and again always with the goal in mind that you're trying to develop a nice range of hue and value all throughout your leaf keep irregularity in mind as well try to stay away from the look of outlines and organized patterns this is very important when you're drawing or painting anything that is organic, or at least this is the case when you're going for more of a believable look. So with this one, the colors that I went with were initially watered down new gamboge. Then I dropped in my orange, which is a mixture of new gamboge and pyrrole red. Then I dropped in just plain pyrrole red. And then what I did was I added in some burnt umber into my pyrrole red, to create a reddish brown. And that was my final darkest color. I did my best to keep it moving, to work loosely, and to do all of my hue and value development that I wanted to get done while the paint was still wet so that I could have those nice soft effects. And then just like with the other leaves, I did my final splattering for a little bit of texture. Moving on to my fourth leaf. So with this one, I went in initially with a pale watered down orange. So this is my mixture of new gamboge plus pyrrole red. And I'm pretty sure that there is a tiny bit of burnt umber in there as well. But I'm okay with that because I want this leaf to look very, very dry and crispy at the end. So I will be using plenty of brown in this one anyway but the same process still applies. I am making my way towards my darker colors, going in with a lightest layer initially, and when I feel I have enough color on my paper, 
I remove that color from my paintbrush bristles and I go in with just water in my paintbrush to soften that color even more and maybe even remove some of that excess color to reveal a little bit more of that whiteness and brightness of the paper under that color. Notice how I'm really taking my time with this initial layer, running my paintbrush bristles gently over this entire shape quite a few times. Once I have arrived at that nice even sheen all throughout this first lightest layer, I am now going in and dropping in some of my reddish brown, my mixture of pyrrole red and burnt umber. And then my final darkest color is going to be plain burnt umber. I wanted this leaf to have that very crispy dried look to it. As I continue adding my second, my third colors on top of those first colors, I always make sure to leave at least some of that first color shining through and then some sections where the second color is showing and then I'm only placing the third color in some areas so that at the end I can have that variety of hues. It's never my intention to cover up my previous colors entirely with the next color that I am using. If I do that, I'm gonna flatten out the leaf. Once I'm happy with that variety of hue and value, I remove that color from my paintbrush bristles and I go in with a tiny bit of splattering. And finally, it is time to tackle that last leaf. For this one, I'm gonna be using more greens and also browns. I removed all of that previous color from my paintbrush bristles and I am once again going in with my first layer of my lightest, palest color, which in this case is a light green created by a mixture of undersea green and Hansa yellow light. For this leaf, I have my smaller paintbrush on hand that I'm gonna be using for the details in the next phase of this process, which is my size three round brush. You can see me holding this smaller round brush in my left hand as I am painting with my size 10 brush with my right hand. And the reason why I have this one on hand for this leaf right now is because with this size three round brush, I can really clean up those serrated edges for this leaf if I need to. This smaller brush provides me a little bit more control so that I can go in and clean up those edges that are very difficult to get into with my size 10 round brush. So after having taken my time with painting in that initial light green layer, I very quickly switched to my smaller brush, did any cleanup along those edges that I needed more control in, and very quickly switched on back to my size 10 round brush to continue developing my hues and my values. So right here you can see me start to drop in some darker green. So this is plain undersea green with water added in that I am dropping into this first lighter green layer. And you can see how because I took my time with that initial light green layer and because I am making sure to work relatively quickly, I am getting those nice soft transitions between my different colors. After having dropped in some of my undersea green in a very irregular way, I then went ahead and dropped in some burnt umber here and there. And I just continue dropping in these different colors, creating little blooms and texture here and there until I arrive at a look that I like. Have fun with this process and notice the little blooms and effects that are happening as you continue dropping in that color on paint that is still wet and come back to see the leaf as a whole. Continue having irregularity and variety in mind. And once I'm happy with my variety of hue and value all throughout this leaf, you're gonna notice that I switch on back to my size three round brush to do a little bit more cleaning up of edges. I do my best to do any cleanup work quickly that needs to get done in order for me to be able to do my splattering before my paint starts to dry. Once I'm happy with how everything looks, I go ahead and switch on back to my size 10 round brush, make sure that the bristles are nice and clean, and just splatter a little bit of water onto this paint that is still wet. All right, and with that, it is time to move into phase number four, which is the last phase of this painting process for these leaf studies. So all of this work that we're gonna be doing right now in this phase, we're gonna be doing wet on dry. This means that all of the work that we have done previously should be completely dry before you get started with these details and the veins that we're gonna be adding in. And the reason this is, is because we want the details that we're adding in at this point 
to remain sharp and defined. If you paint these details on paper that is still wet, that watercolor paint is going to expand out and you're gonna have more of a soft, blurred out effect. All right, so aside from making sure that everything is completely dry, another thing I make sure to do is to select the right paintbrush for the job on hand, which is at this point adding in smaller details. So for this, I am using my size three round brush. And you probably saw before I started painting in these details in this first leaf, that I actually took the time to test out the consistency and the color of my paint mixture on a scrap piece of watercolor paper before going in and starting to paint in these veins. This is very helpful and I highly recommend doing that because it is very important that when you're painting in these veins, which are lines that you're painting in with one single stroke, it's important that the consistency of your color mixture on your palette that you're loading up your paintbrush with is helpful for you and contains the right amount of water so that you're able to effectively load up your paintbrush bristles and go in and smoothly create that single stroke. If your color mixture doesn't contain enough water, if it's too dry on your color mixing palette, you're likely not going to be able to load up your paintbrush bristles properly and you're going to have a broken line or more of a dry brushing effect where you're not able to lay down that line smoothly. So I always have scrap pieces of watercolor paper on hand when I'm painting with watercolor for this kind of practice or test before using my color mixtures on my painting. Make sure that you are taking time to test out the paint to water ratios in your color mixtures that you're gonna be using for this part of the process so that they're actually helpful for you. And you can also practice creating thin tapered lines on the scrap piece of watercolor paper before painting in the veins in your leaves, which is also very helpful, especially if you don't have that practice in. So I'm just barely touching the tip of my paintbrush to my paper so that I can make sure that those lines are very, very thin and I'm trying my best to create tapered lines so that that line becomes even thinner and thinner as that vein moves out and away from that central vein. So practice that before jumping in, practice painting thin lines, practice creating the right consistency that is gonna be helpful for you before jumping in to adding in these details in your leaves. I promise you, you won't regret it. All right, so as I am painting in these veins for these leaves, the color that I am using for the veins goes hand in hand with the color that I used as a base color, if you will, for that leaf, for that initial layer that I painted in in the previous phase. So this means that if I am adding in the veins into a leaf that is primarily green, then I used a green color mixture. If I am painting in the veins in a leaf that is primarily orange or reddish orange, I am using a reddish orange color to paint in the leaves. But something that is key that I am making sure to do as I am painting in the veins, aside from choosing the right color, is I am making sure that I'm initially going in with a pale, translucent version, watered down version of that color. The reason why this is, is because I don't want to go in super stark, super dark, and super contrasting with my veins. This can look very unnatural if you go in and start painting lines, especially when your previous wash of color is very light. You're going to create a lot of contrast and that is going to be very stark looking and it's not going to look very natural. So for me, it's much better and it helps me arrive at much more believable results when I go in initially with my color that I have selected in a very pale watered down state. And then with those initial lighter, paler veins painted in, I then allow myself to go in with this same color in a little bit more of a saturated state, meaning less water, and I just darken certain sections of those veins. This process makes those veins look a lot more natural, less dark looking, and less distracting. I try to incorporate some level of imperfection, slight curves, etc., in order to stay away from stiffness as I am painting in the veins as well. So right here you can see how I am just finishing up with painting in the light translucent veins here in this maple leaf. And now that I have those lighter veins in, I am going in with a darker color, more saturated color, 
and I'm only going over certain sections of these veins. This creates a variety in value and translucency even within the veins and leads to a more natural look as opposed to going in with a very dark color and painting in very stiff, dark looking, contrasting veins all throughout. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to painting in the veins in this last brownish, reddish leaf that I have here. So going in initially with a relatively translucent version of this reddish brown that I have created, painting that in quickly and then going back in with a little bit more color to darken certain sections. And I'm also doing my best to create those tapered ends at the end of my strokes by doing that quick single stroke and lifting up my paintbrush as I move out and away from the central vein of the leaf. All right, so just finishing up with the veins in this last leaf. So this is a green leaf, so I am going in with a green color mixture. Right here, I notice right away that I'm going in way too dark too soon. This looks way too drawn out and too stark looking, especially in those sections where I just have a lighter green underneath. I remove that color from my paintbrush bristles and make sure that I'm going in with a little bit more water in my paintbrush. So now you can see me go in and painting in lighter looking veins. And then if I wanna darken certain sections, I go ahead and do that but it's all about taking incremental steps towards those darker colors. Okay, so moving on to the very last thing that I'm gonna be doing here, I am just going to be adding some final details and doing any refinements that need to get done. You might not even have to do this at all. It totally depends on how your studies went, but I did wanna make sure to add in these last couple of techniques in case you might find them helpful. So the very first thing that I'm gonna be doing is softening some veins that are a little bit too dark and stark looking for my taste. So what I am doing here, and this is clean water that I'm going in with, this is very important, and everything is completely dry by this point. That's very important if you're gonna be doing this gentle scrubbing technique. But essentially what I am doing is using just a tiny bit of clean water in my paintbrush, I am doing gentle back and forth motions over that section of that vein that I wanna soften or make look lighter. I just do it a few times and then I go in with my absorbent towel to lift up some of that pigment and that should soften that section of that vein. If you're gonna be doing this gentle scrubbing technique, make sure that you're going in with clean water in your paintbrush and that you're only doing this minimally and gently. If you keep doing it over and over again in one single section of your paper, you're likely going to damage your paper and you're not gonna be able to fix that. But it can be a great technique that can help you fix small mistakes or make them less noticeable. And the last thing that I am doing is I am darkening some sections along some of these edges for some of these leaves. I am not trying to create an outline around the leaves or even darken all around every single leaf or anything like that. I'm just going over certain sections of some of those outer edges. This creates a little bit more contrast and definition along some sections of those edges and makes these leaves pop. I'm making sure to keep it loose, subtle, and irregular. There is no need to go overboard with these last details. Make sure that you're using the right color and also the right amount of water in your color mixture as you're doing this so that these shapes that you're painting in don't look too stark. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, make sure to check out everything that I am offering over at my Patreon membership website because for a very small amount a month, you're gonna get immediate access to my exclusive tutorials, classes, and resources that I don't share anywhere else. All of these exclusive tutorials include my downloadable outline sketches so that you don't have to start from scratch, reference photos, and my supply lists. There's already a library of over 75 sketching and watercolor painting tutorials that are real time, meaning they are not sped up or edited. They are fully narrated and I take you through my entire process, making sure to explain everything as clearly as possible step by step. Two new exclusive full length tutorials are added into this exclusive library every single month. 
For those of you who are interested in really taking your artwork to the next level and want to know all of the inside secrets that I learned about in art school and courses that I've invested in myself, there's also a full library on classes on art fundamentals in which all of the bases are covered. That library has now over 35 classes and workshops all have assignments at the end that help you actually put your knowledge to the test. And there's a brand new class or workshop added at the beginning of every single month. As if all of this weren't enough, you also get a weekly sketchbook prompt sent to your inbox to help you stay consistent with your art practice. There's a live training, workshop, or paint along session with me every single month. Members in the $15 tier and upwards get access to thorough feedback from me on their work whenever they need it, and much, much more. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things, which you can choose from depending on your goals and needs needs. So go ahead and check it out. I'm going to make sure to leave a link where you can find out more down below in the description box of this video. And I would love, love, love to get to know more about you and your work and have you join this innermost art community of mine. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.